here we go. Well, everybody out there, welcome. Thank you for another uh, episode here of Big Idea. This is Dr. Jeff Hanna. I am at Atlas Health Australia here in North Lakes. And what we do on these particular little videos here is we have a look at uh, little bits of research, things like that, trying to take a lot of really complicated ideas but then try to make them as simple as we possibly can. Now, as you guys know, I have a um, knack for taking an idea that you could probably say this short and making it this long. But why do I do that? I find that by circling back and explaining some of the, the subtleties, the nuances, we're not just glossing over some of the stuff, but actually giving you a, a better appreciation, deeper insight for some of the intricacies of all this stuff. But most importantly, you know, why go through all of this in the first place? It's so that if you are either a health care practitioner or if you are a person looking for solutions with your health care, that you've got the best possible information out there that you can understand the options that you have available, both what's on the lines and also reading between the lines so that you can find the hopefully the help results that you're ultimately looking for so that you can enjoy the best quality of life possible. So that's what we aim to do on these little videos here. If you've checked out a few of the other ones here before, great, awesome, appreciate it. Um, I'll also ask you the favor right off the bat that uh, if you um, have seen these videos or if you like this one here, we'd encourage you to click the like button uh, down for YouTube and also then to subscribe to the channel. That's ultimately how this information gets out to people. It's only by other people sharing it, liking it, so that the ranking goes up. So, on that note, let us get the ball rolling here. I'll just verify. Yep, so we are actually recording. That's always important. And what we are going to look at here is a report. This one was published uh, in uh, oh, two years ago now. Wow, time goes quick in that regard. Um, 2020. On many airs, cervicogenic endolymphatic high drops and other vestibular and cervicovagenic vertebrae as spectrum of same disease. A novel concept. What does the word novel mean? It means it's new, it's innovative, it's something like that. Well, both yes and no. Um, I'd make the case that some of the stuff that's in this article has been around for a long period of time, especially uh, amongst the upper cervical chiropractors. But nevertheless, um, you know, this isn't a, a territory kind of thing. This is about getting the information out there. So this one here, super important for people who experience vertigo and dizziness. So, as we usually do these, we're going to do the rapid fire through of the start of the article, and then we're going to explain what the heck does that actually mean. Vertigo and dizziness are one of the commonest and least understood symptoms. Vestibular vertical of many years disease and benign proximal positional vertigo, aka BPPV, and cervicogenic dizziness are classified as separate entities. The present study was undertaken to study the association between cervical signs and symptoms in patients with vestibular vertigo of many years disease, BPPV, and cervicogenic dizziness. Most of the patients of many years disease, 80% for one sided, unilateral, 88% for bilateral, both sides, BPPV, 75% if it was on the right side, 67% if it was on the left, and cervicogenic dizziness, 90%, had associated symptoms of neck pain or headache and were found to be positive for neck tightness and or asymmetry of the soldier. They conclude vestibular dizziness of Meniere's disease, BPPV, and cervicogenic dizziness may be spectrum of the same disease with underlying myofascial problems. There's a lot of really interesting information in that. There's a lot of information. And particularly for people who experience dizziness, vertigo, things like that, it's a absolutely wretched kind of sensation. You know, as awful as pain syndromes are, so including headaches, migraines, things like that, you know, if a person's either A, vertigo, the sensation that the world is spinning around them, or dizziness, that you're on like a rocky boat and you can't find your feet, or you can actually have a bit of both going on in the same person at the same time. You can't block that stuff out. It is really, really life disabling. And the problem is on the outside, these people look so very much the same. And it's very common. It's far more common in all of its different forms than, you know, certainly I would have ever believed when I first started doing this work many, many years ago now. And it is by far one of the most common things that we see in terms of the practice. But these are also so many of the people that we are able to help. 
So let's start doing a little bit of a breakdown about what all of this means in terms, most importantly, of being able to help people with these different kinds of things. So in particular, they're talking about three kinds of disorders, many errors, BPPV, and cervicogenic vertigo. I'll jump a little bit ahead in the article here, and per always, we'll put it in the link and all that sort of stuff if you want to check out the whole thing on your own here, but I just wanted to hit some of the, the highlights. Now, one of the first things that's important to know about these three different conditions is that they are, relatively speaking, what are known as diagnosis of exclusion. A diagnosis of exclusion means that you have had a MRI of your brain looking for tumors, bleeding, infections, all of the fun exotic pathology, really dangerous kind of stuff. But by and large, they don't see anything. Well, they can't find anything. There's no swelling. There's no whatever. And so diagnosis of exclusion means that the diagnosis is made based on the presenting symptoms. So as it relates to these three conditions here, Meniere's disease is characterized under typical vertical syndrome and is a diagnosis of exclusion. When I had learned this way back in school, its three primary hallmarks were transient vertigo, transient uh, tinnitus, so ringing in the ear, and also transient loss of hearing. That in some different percent and degree, because it's different in every single person, everybody's neurology is ever so slightly different, that those are the three hallmarks of it. And they say, okay, well, if you experience combinations of these things or two out of these three things, okay, we're going to say that you have this thing called Meniere's disease. But what did we say? The MRI looks like it's pretty much normal. BPPV, on the other hand, most common cause of acute vertigo characterized by brief attacks of world spinning around rotatory vertigo triggered by movements such as lying down or rolling over in bed or extending the neck, which each episode lasting only seconds. So it's like moments of, whoa, this is really bad. Doesn't usually have the, quote, hearing stuff associated with it and usually goes away. Not uncommonly, patients also complain of persisting symptoms, including disturbed gait, so your uh, ability to walk feels like you're off balance, blurred vision, and dizziness, and it can sometimes be misleading. And so, same thing. People are looking in the eyes. People are looking more at the brain and all of this sort of stuff, trying to figure out what is the, the cause of it. Uh, for those of you who maybe have or know somebody with BPPV, one of the prevailing hypotheses is that it's actually caused by a malposition of crystals in the inner ear that are responsible for sending your brain the information about balance, equilibrium, and all of that sort of stuff. Um, this might be me jumping a little bit ahead, but I don't believe that hypothesis personally. Now, this is my opinion, and I'm not arguing against the existing, or excuse me, the existence of these crystals. But if that's the hypothesis, why can't we actually see those things on imaging? We can't see the crystals on MRIs on CT scans, on x-rays, or anything like that. It sometimes is where people are like they're chasing a ghost in the machine, and so oftentimes people, specialists, all that sort of stuff, say, oh, it sounds like you're fighting a virus. Well, that's cute, that's easy, because you can't see a virus on diagnostic images, and so you attribute it to something that you can't actually prove. Well, that's a logical fallacy. That's called an appeal to silence, appeal to ignorance, something like that. Um, not good enough, uh, in my opinion. So... Part of the reason why the belief is that it's associated with crystals of the inner ear is because of something that's called the Epley Maneuver. And what the Epley Maneuver is, kind of in a nutshell, is if a person's experiencing a vertigo episode, based on the side that you experience it, you are leaning your head backwards, usually over the edge of a bed or something like that, and you turn and move your head in different kinds of directions. And the belief is, is that by moving the head in certain ways, it's going to unlodge those crystals to get them back sitting where they're supposed to be and then the vertigo goes away. Now, I don't actually see that's what's going on. What I see going on is I see that just with the force of gravity, you're mobilizing the joints of the neck. And as we'll talk about in just a wee little bit here, the joints of the neck may actually be the reason why the Epley maneuver works. In other words, it may have nothing to do with crystals in the ear. It may have to do with getting the neck move in the way that it's supposed to, whether by design or by accident.
So neither here nor there, but um, important nevertheless, it relates to BPBV. Now the third bit, cervicogenic dizziness, characterized by presence of imbalance, unsteadiness, disorientation, neck pain, limited cervical range of motion, and may be accompanied by a headache. So what they're making here is a distinction that, again, oftentimes when we're talking about vestibular conditions, things get lumped in together. Um, and so I make it very clear whenever I'm working with somebody who's experiencing these kinds of disorders, I want to know what it is that you're feeling. Are you feeling the vertigo? As we said, the world is spinning around you. Or are you experiencing dizziness? Dizziness is that the world is still, but you're doing something like this, or you're falling, or you feel like you're falling and being pulled over to one side. I repeat, you can experience both. And as I will also be saying a little bit later, you know what, it doesn't really matter per se what you choose to call it, because it may have the same underlying, you know, cause. And if you can address the cause, then, you know, great, the effect should go away. But my point is, it's important to have an appreciation, understanding that there is a difference. And um, as a result of that, then, you know, having just a, a better better appreciation again in terms of what people are actually suffering, experiencing, not just lumping everybody's experience together because there are these differences. So that's in a nutshell what they are talking about here. So what the authors here it note is they say, you know, huh, it's interesting. There's a lot of people, a lot of, a lot of people who are diagnosed with these three things who seem to also experience issues with their neck. And so, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to have a look at that. And see if, you know, maybe there's an association, if there's a link or something like that. So what did they do? They got 132 patients ranging from, and check this out, because a lot of times we think of balance disorders of, you know, elderly people getting older, 75 years, but uh -uh, they had them all the way down to 15. I have seen kids as young as 10, 15, 20 with the really debilitating kind of dizziness and vertigo. And that's hard enough if a person's in their 40s, 50s, 60s. But, you know, you can appreciate the sense of desperation and anxiety for people, you know, when they're that young and they're already experiencing things like that. So they had 132 people who had been diagnosed with many errors, BPPV, or cervicogenic dizziness. And then they were looking to see, you know what, are they also experiencing issues associated with the neck. And so the classic symptoms of people who experience, you know, neck issues, first up, they're going to have either headache, neck pain, shoulder tightness, or maybe even migraine. Now, why is that? Well, the nerves out of the upper part of the neck, they go to the head. So if there's ever irritation, not anything getting squished, compressed, or anything like that, but just irritation to a nerve, well, that can cause a headache. Obviously, if you've got nerves going up this way, you can also have nerves going down this way. Um, particularly the nerves at C4 and 5, these are the ones that go to person's shoulders. So not just the, the tightness, but when people say, oh, it, my shoulders just feel so sore and it's pulling here down between the shoulder blade, that's actually a telltale sign that something is not right mechanically in the lower part of their neck. And this is perhaps me jumping just a, a little bit ahead of here again, I have the tendency to do that. But you might be wondering, it's like, okay, well, you know, what and how from a neurological perspective can the neck be involved with the balance condition? Okay, well, in a nutshell, the neck has three kinds of nerve receptors. And we're talking about the muscles in the neck. We're talking about the connective tissue, what's otherwise known as myofascia. Um, it's also in the ligaments. And it's in the joints themselves to determine and detect motion and things like that. So these three kinds of nerve receptors. Well, the first one that we have is what's called a pain receptor. It goes up to the brain. It lets it know if there's pain or damage or something like that. The second kind is what is known as a proprioceptor. And a proprioceptor, actually, I'll jump around a little bit to a slightly different order. I'm going to say a pressure receptor, or what is what's known as a mechanoreceptor. Mechanoreceptor detects external stimuli and motion. In other words, it sends information to your brain about what is the state of the joints from the outside. So is something pushing on it 
like this to maybe where it needs to reflexively move away or something like that. But the third one, and this is actually the most abundant kind of nerve receptor that's in the neck is what's called the proprioceptor. The proprioceptor really does a, a couple of things. A, it goes up to the brain and it goes and collects into the exact same centers that are responsible for processing balance and equilibrium information. In other words, the same cluster of cells that process the balance information coming from the inner ear, guess what? It also receives a huge amount of input from those joints and muscles and connective tissues in the upper part of the neck. And in addition to that, if the brain then detects, whoa, we've got a balance issue or something like that, then what it's going to do is it can actually send a, a cascade effect getting the body to compensate. And the way that it does that is it does that by causing the muscles to tighten. So frequently, people then, their body reflexively does something like this, where one shoulder hikes up, their head turns one way, something like that. And so people then say, oh, well, you've got a posture problem, or oh, okay, you've got tight muscles and something like that. No, 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 no. Muscles only ever do what nerves tell them to do. So if and when you see a person who has a posture distortion, there's a proprioceptive disruption somewhere in their body. And it doesn't necessarily mean that they're always going to be experiencing pain or anything like that. Why? Because it's a completely different receptor. So if you have damage to, say, proprioceptors, or they're sending the brain faulty information, but you're not necessarily having pain or damage to the joint, a lot of times what we presume, or what people presume, is that, oh, okay, well, if I'm feeling fine, I must be okay. And unfortunately, that's oftentimes how these kinds of problems can begin in the first place. Essentially, the tiny problem starts to accumulate, you know, like exponential growth, unpaid compound interest. It adds up over a long period of time, and then boom, seemingly out of the blue, you develop a disequilibrium kind of condition. Point is, is that the nerve receptors in the neck super important, and they tie into those exact same centers of the brain that are responsible, as I said, for balance and equilibrium. So that's what their logic was here. So what they wanted to see is, okay, these are the patients, and they did this then for everybody. This is what they were officially diagnosed with having. Again, based on symptoms, based on, there's nothing weird on their MRI, but this is what they're describing. They're experiencing many errors on either one side or the other. They're experiencing it on both sides. Then they're experiencing, say, the vertigo component only, right side, left side, and then the cervicogenic dizziness where they feel like they're doing this. Again, not the vertigo spinning, but the off-balance kind of sensation. And so they were checking, okay, headache, neck pain, headache, neck pain, neck pain, neck pain, neck pain, neck pain, headache, tightness, misalignment, shoulder asymmetry. So all that stuff that I just showed you, check out these numbers. If you have many errors on the one side, out of those people, 80% had neck signs and symptoms. If they had bilateral many errors, it was 87%. If it was the BPPV, if it was on the right side, 72. If it was on the left side, 67. And if they had the cervicogenic dizziness, 90% of them were experiencing some kind of headache, neck pain, neck tightness, shoulder asymmetry, something like that. For a grand whopping total, basically of 82%. And the probability, that's what this little number right down here is, the probability that this is accurate, 999 to 1 is the short of it. In other words, those are very, very significant findings. And what the findings are illustrating here is that there is a clear cut association between neck problems and this disequilibrium conditions and not just one of the disequilibrium conditions it's across the board all of them so what do the authors then go on to describe and this is the part what they talk about being the novel hypothesis and again, this is not me being too cheeky and all that sort of stuff, but for those of us, again, in the upper cervical world, we've been doing this long, when the docs who have been doing this years and decades before I am, we've been talking about this for absolutely ever. 
This isn't new. You want to look up something, check out any of Michael Burkhan's work. Uh, Blair chiropractic researcher on the relationship between the neck and many ears. Look at anything that I've written on my own blog articles and things like that on many ears, BPPV, cervicogenic dizziness, um, mal debarkment syndrome, um, vestibular neuritis, labyrinthitis. Again, whatever you choose to call it. So what do these guys actually say? They say that they're finding such a strong association here that we can't help but question, you know what, is it possible that Meniere's is actually more appropriately what's called cervicogenic hydrops? In other words, something is disrupting the eustachian tube. The consequence of disrupting the station tube is that it screws around with your sense of hearing, screws around with um, pressure, which can create tinnitus, different things like that, and that some of the swelling then can also affect the balance centers of the brain, and that's what produces the vertigo effect. So cervicogenic means it's coming from the neck. So these guys are saying, you know what, many errors could be a disorder that has nothing to do with the inner ear. It has something to do with the mechanical orientation of the neck. Moreover, that all of these may actually be different manifestations of the same disease or the same disorder. What that means as a hypothesis is that whether you call it many ears, whether you call it BPPV, whether you call it cervicogenic dizziness, that's a description of the effects. But the underlying cause may actually be the same. And look to the neck, may have nothing to do with the inner ear. What they hypothesize, this happens due to underlying myofascial problems with result in postural habits, specific activities, or lack of activity at compensations for prior injuries. Massive thing right there, prior injuries. So this is where I need to take a little bit of a creative license here and then adapt it into the kind of work that you know I do as a, a Blair Upper Cervical Chiropractor, where my focus and structure is on you know what is the health orientation of the joints in your neck and how do they relate to the function health of your nerve system. Okay, well, as we said, you've got all of these different nerve receptors in the joints. So if and when a person has ever had a physical injury, and again, didn't break, didn't dislocate, and maybe there wasn't even bleeding or bruising, um, but enough that it nevertheless caused a bit of a shift, that little shift adding up at 1% to 2% per year over 10 to 20 years can start to cause some really significant issues. So you may imagine, okay, let's say the person's five years old and they have a horrific fall as they're learning to bike. Well, if they get hit at just the wrong angle, you know, by the time that they're 15 years old, that injury could have been there already for 10 years. And is it any wonder that we then see the kids, you know, compounded with what they're doing on their computers and their devices and all of that sort of stuff, we see such significant postural distortions. Again, not having anything to do with laziness, but as a reflection about how the body is trying to compensate because of the information that those proprioceptors are sending to the brain, causing the muscle tightness on the other side. And what we're talking about here, at least in the chiropractic sense, is not the kind of thing that you can just simply stretch out. So I do advocate this for absolutely everybody who experiences some kind of, you know, body pain or balance kind of disorder. You know what? First things first, try to just stretch it out. See if by getting a stretch, getting a massage, by trying to balance out the posture, the tightness, the issues on your own, see if that resolves it. Because that is going to be by far the easiest kind of thing. Again, that's what an Epley maneuver is. That is you or somebody else assisting you just trying to get mobility through your body. And does it matter how you do it, whether you're lying on your back, whether you're doing yoga, whether you're doing Pilates, whether you're doing stretching, whether you're doing any of that sort of stuff there, it's great, it's awesome, and it's going to help a huge amount of people. But for those people where it doesn't, it's most likely because those joints have gotten stuck. I'm going to try to get on the camera. There, there we go. have gotten stuck in a certain way that no amount of stretching on your own, no amount of strengthening the other muscles, no amount of any of that sort of stuff is quite able to get it.
You see, if that was the case, then there's no reason for the chiropractic profession to even exist. And in the same breath, a person doesn't need a chiropractor if they're just able to stretch it out on their own. No, what a chiropractor's role is, is they are, if you've got that kind of condition, not broken, not dislocated, but it's not just a little boo-boo either, and it's not getting better on its own within a reasonable period of time. It could very well be because the joint has gotten stuck, it's gotten entrapped, and you've got to get the right kind of motion back through it so that the system can actually release. If you can release it, at least the point and the principle then, is that it allows and gives the wisdom of your body that opportunity to get the right kind of movement through there, to get it to heal, and as it does that, all of that faulty information that the brain is getting bombarded with from them proprioceptors, from them pain receptors, that over a period of time that starts to calm down and ultimately go away. So that's the hypothesis, that's the role that we try to do right here. And so again, I repeat what they were saying, this happens due to underlying myofascial problems, in other words, they're saying the posture, posture, specific activities, lock of activity, and compensations for the prior injuries right there. In other words, these are not necessarily chemical conditions. As a result, it's not necessarily a chemical solution. You can come off the caffeine, you can come off the salt, you can change the rest of the stuff in your diet, you can de-stress, and all of these things, guess what? They're probably going to be good for you. But as long as that physical condition is still there, you may nevertheless be up against a block in the road. But if you can get that block resolved, then guess what? You might be able to get back to getting functional improvements for all of these kinds of things. And that's what we aim to do. So the main underlying pathophysiology, in other words, the cause appears to be ischemia of inner ear, which occurs due to compression of vertebral artery resulting from cervical problems giving rise to oral symptoms, similar to a migraine, in Meniere's disease and other syndromes of cervicogenic vertigo. And so they're saying it's not just the, the proprioceptors, but you've also got two arteries that transmit through the vertebrae in your neck, and they are ultimately going to supply about a third of all of the blood to your brain. But based on their structure and their orientation, they actually supply effectively all of the blood to those balance and coordination centers in your brainstem, in your cerebellum, in those areas right at the, the base and the bottom right through here. And so, same thing, is if you've got that mechanical kind of injury, even if it's not squishing the artery all the way down like this, if it produces a little bit of narrowing, either A, of the fluid going up, or B, and this is perhaps even more significant, of the fluid going back down, what it can do is it can start to screw around with the normal dynamics in terms of how blood is supposed to be going to your brain, get like a momentary little blackout kind of sensation. My personal experience, that seems to be more common in the BPPV kinds of conditions rather than it is the cervicogenic dizziness. And that just has to do with the, the nature and the combinations of physical injuries that people can experience. If you would, you can picture a person on a roller coaster getting their head whipped around like this any number of different directions, okay? Well, some of it's probably just sore muscles, but then part of it is because they jammed a joint this way and then it may be another one this way. And depending on the combination of where the dust actually settles, and that's going to be different in absolutely everybody, that seems to be the prevailing thing, at least in my opinion, in terms of what the difference is between why a person may experience a vertigo versus why they may experience a dizziness. It's a hypothesis, it's observational, but I think it's interesting nevertheless. So here they go again. So we've got to consider the blood flow to, from the, uh, the arteries and also dizziness vertigo associated with neck spasm also due to increased, there it is, proprioceptive inputs from the neck due to pressure on neck receptors. In other words, damage here affecting the quality of the information that's going up to the brain and as a consequence could be the, well, there's that word again, pathophysiology the cause, or at the very least, contributing factor for when people may experience these imbalanced kinds of conditions. And so, as I'm rounding out this you know, particular little conversation, and I do hope that this has been um, not just informative, but also um, valuable 
um, whether you or somebody else, again, that you know is experiencing dizziness, vertigo, and again, doesn't matter what you call it, whether it's many years, BPBV, and all that sort of stuff. They have probably been to any number of different doctors and specialists and brain MRIs and more brain MRIs and water in the air and air in the air and in the eyes and all of this sort of stuff. But what's my point in all of this is if they have not had a proper detailed look at what's going on in their neck, they could be missing a really, really big piece of the puzzle. And this may not be the only thing that they need to ultimately get the resolution that they're looking for, but you know what? If it's an important piece of the puzzle, it's an important piece of the puzzle. It could be the missing link. It could also be the first step in the process, but one way or another demands the right kind of investigation. And so please, please, wherever you would be out there, real important then to get this, you know, properly you know, checked out. Of course, you know, what am I going to say? I'm going to say, make sure that you go see, you know, an upper cervical chiropractor. Again, they're not the kind of chiropractor who does like general manipulation or anything like that. It's a far more detailed approach. There's no twisting, there's no cracking, there's no any of that sort of stuff. Can you do it whether a person's 15 years old? Yes. Can you do it if they're 75 years old? Yes. Um, can you do it even if there are sometimes some of the blood flow issues to the brain? Yes. You got to be cautious. You got to be careful. But I'd make the case that it could very well be that that's the issue that they need resolved. And that's why it's so difficult then finding, you know, the right kind of person to do it. Um, so on that note, you know, not only just check out the kind of information that we have on our own website, which is atlashealth.com.au, but also go check out uh, more information you might be able to find out through uh, my association. Uh, it's blairchiropractic.com. Lots and lots and lots of information and also lots of options and lots of help available again to help these people who for so many of them are told there's nothing that you can do. Well, I would disagree. So they conclude our highlight, our study highlights the fact that most vestibular disorders like many airs, BPPV and cervical genic business have underlying postural problems with symptoms and signs of neck pain, headache, neck tightness, asymmetry of shoulders. And I would make the case that the postural problems, that they are a reflection of the mechanical misalignment of the space between the vertebra, that if you can resolve that, the posture starts to release, and then all of the stuff with your physiotherapist, with your osteopath, with your yoga instructor, with your Pilates instructor, that then all of that has a much better chance of working the way that it's supposed to. It's all about getting the best kind of outcome. The underlying issues, myofascial problems, tightness, tissue injuries, are they real culprit, which lead to a series of events with end organ affection at the inner lever causing vestibular symptoms. In other words, damage here, sending faulty information to the brain, and that's what you need to look at in terms of the underlying issue, but also then the solution that you may be looking for after all of this time. So that's what we've got for you on uh, this, uh, this round again of Big Idea. And again, I really hope that you found this one both valuable, informative, all that sort of stuff. Um, if you have enjoyed this one, again, I'm going to request that you, number one, that you like the video. Number two, you share it with anyone and everyone who you think may benefit from checking this out. But then number three is subscribe to the channel. Again, the higher that we are in terms of the channel subscriptions, the likes and all that sort of stuff, the interwebs, they take note of that kind of stuff. And then this information becomes available for so many other people who may not otherwise know that it even exists. So thank you guys for watching this one. Hope you enjoyed it. So until next time, take care. We'll see you.